Hi guys, sorry about that, I was muted. So we will go ahead and get started. Um, before we start, let's go over just a few housekeeping items really quick. Um, while you are um, during the webinar, your microphone will be muted. We encourage any questions to be typed into the chat section, um, which can be found on the lower section of your screen. Please make sure you select to send your chat to all participants or all panelists so that we can all see those. Our presenters will address those questions at the end of the presentation. Individuals who signed up for the webinar can log into their account on the NCDA website to view their CEU certificates beginning next week. Groups that are attending will need to return their sign-in sheets to me in order to receive excuse me, certificates. This program is approved for one contact hour of continuing education. Uh, for any questions on continuing education, you can contact me. My name is Alicia Cheek at NCDA Headquarters. My contact information was included in your webinar instructions message. Our presenters today are members of NCDA's International Student Services Committee. We now present working with third-party providers to support international students' career development. And I will turn that over to all of our presenters. Great. Thank you, Alicia. Um, so I'll get started first just by briefly introducing who is on the webinar today. Um, so first up, our, we have Elif Balin, who is an assistant professor of counseling and the coordinator of the career counseling special, specialization at San Francisco State University. Juan Segal is the founder and CEO of International Career Advisory Incorporated, also called ICOA, a career advisory firm for international students in the U.S. Nicole M. Anderson is the Associate Director of Alumni Career Services at Tufts University. Sonia Liang is the Associate Director at the Career Strategy Center of the International Business School at Brandeis University. And I am Kendra Northington, the Senior Career Counselor at the George Washington University School of Engineering and Applied Science. You can read more of our bios on the NCDA website, or you can find us on LinkedIn. So I just want to briefly share a little bit about the committee that we all belong to, which is what brought us together for this webinar. The NCDA International Student Services Committee um, aims to increase the understanding and awareness of the career development needs of international students. Um, it's made up of over 20 career professionals across the U.S., both in higher ed and uh, other specialties of career services. Um, the work of the committee includes research, a online best practice guide for sharing resources, as well as presentations such as this webinar. Uh, you can learn more about the committee on the NCDA website by emailing us at iswg at ncda.org, or you can join the LinkedIn group, which is called NCDA, International Student Career Development Professionals. So our agenda for today, we're going to start with a little bit of background of career development needs for international students. Then we will talk about the role of third-party providers the types of service provider, providers available. And finally, we will discuss a framework for career development professionals to use when deciding whether or not to work with outside providers. It's important to note that although we will mention specific services and providers, it is only for example purposes and does not represent an endorsement from the committee. Um, Although we won't have time to go too far in depth about the details of specific services, we hope that you will leave this webinar with information that will help you or your organization make confident decisions about engaging with outside providers. So first, let's sort of get on the same page and talk about, you know, what do we mean when we say third-party service providers um, and why we sort of chose that as a subject. Um, so we imagine that many of the participants today may currently work in a university or college career services center. Um, however, we also may have folks who are working in another organization that also provides career services to international students. So really when we say third party or outside vendor, we're just talking about a service or a provider 
that is not working for the university or coming from a student, so not peer-led resources. Um, we hope that the information we share will be useful to anyone who is working with international students. Um, and as the number of international students has grown, um, so have the unique needs of those students when it comes to their job or career search. Universities have demonstrated their commitment to these students with dedicated staff, specialized programming, and more accessible resources. Nonetheless, there remain some barriers and gaps as to what university career services are able to provide. Um, therefore, we've seen this increasing trend of providers offering their services, so we thought it would be helpful to talk about how universities can partner well. Um, so to understand this trend, let's look a little bit at the evolution of career services in higher ed. Many of you may already be familiar with this graphic. It comes from the work of Farouk Day and Christine Cruz Vergara. And essentially, it's just showing how career services has evolved from simple job placement to more integrated uh, services. Changes in societal norms and economic conditions have really emphasized the importance of connected communities where students feel more engaged with alumni, employers, and other industry professionals. Um, and international students also want to benefit from those connections. However, some of the unique challenges that international students face can make it more difficult for them to form these connected communities. So let's take a look at some of the unique challenges and gaps that international students face when they enter the job search. Uh, much research has been done on this topic already, so we're not going to spend a lot of time unpacking this. Um, I definitely encourage everyone, there'll be a references section of our presentation where you can read more about the work um, relating to these challenges and gaps. But as you can see, for international students, there are just more complicated visa and immigration policies, which affects their ability to work and get experience here in the US. Um, due to the changing nature of these policies and the complications of them, it's difficult both for students, career service providers, and employers to fully understand what all the work authorization policies are. Um, for career service professionals in university settings, they may lack the staff, funding, or knowledge in order to be able to offer more specialized career support. Um, and for employers, even if they are not prohibited from hiring international students, um, they may be hesitant to do so. The most recent NACE survey found that only 28% of employers had plans to hire international students. Um, so with all of these additional barriers, international students have expressed some dissatisfaction with their school's connection to potential employers. And this is where outside providers can come in to help close some of these gaps. So now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Quan, who will share more about third-party specialists in higher education. Thank you so much, Kendra, and good afternoon, everyone. So as the AE consulting partner myself, I feel very humbled to be here and share my experience with all of you here. And since Kendra has shared great summary of challenges and gaps, I'm going to take about five minutes here to share a bit of my background and speak about the wish list that I've seen among career centers and some of the key areas where third party specialists can fill existing gaps. And a little bit of my background. So my background is in human capital consulting. And when I moved to the US six years ago, I went through an extensive career search myself, which feels like yesterday. And I truly understand how hard it is to overcome cultural and language barriers. I finally landed a job at Deloitte and worked with Fortune 500 clients on various HR projects. And from that point on, I started serving the international student population as a volunteer coach and noticing gaps that I could fill by leveraging not only my experience in breaking through cultural barriers, but also my technical side as an HR professional. And I started building a community of career-driven international students and founded ICOA in 2017. 
Now we offer different coaching programs for students depending on the stage of their career search because each stage has different unique needs. And we also have training series for career centers that want to build competencies to serve this population. And for the next slide, I would like to summarize a little bit about wish list, the top wish list I have seen when collaborating with career centers. Number one, you realize that generalized career advice is not enough to support this population. You wish that you could have someone with strong knowledge and experience to serve this population. That's number one. And the second one is you're looking for ways to implement some programs that can engage your students better, especially in the early stages of their academic year. And number three, it has been challenging to place international students in the US job market. So you're looking for employers who want to hire international students. If you want to find a list of employers who have submitted petitions to employ H-1B workers, you can simply go to USCIS H-1B Data Hub or use the third party vendor like myvisajobs.com. But having that list doesn't guarantee employment for our students. At the end of the day, it is our students who have to build relationships with those employers and walk into the meeting room and seal the deal. So in summary, to successfully coach international students and help them secure employment, the program needs to be very personalized. All three wish lists need to be integrated and implemented. And for the next slide, I'd like to translate those top three wish lists into the three scenarios where third party vendors can potentially bridge existing gaps. For example, if the schools do not have specialized career professionals to serve this population, there are specialists in the market out there who can help you with anything you're looking for. They could be an immigration law expert or an HR or an industry expert or someone with global experience and cross-cultural awareness. And if you look at the orange bubble on the left, it talks about extra manpower or proven methodologies. Hiring an, a vendor can help you save time from developing something from scratch. However, when working with third-party vendors, it is important to think about the end goals that you'd like to achieve and please feel free to ask your service provider if they can guarantee a result that you want to achieve for you. And the last bubble on the right bottom, the pink one, is about the diversity or new ideas. Third party vendors who have experience working with different schools with all sizes can bring you some new perspective and ideas that you never thought of before. And because of all of these possibilities, uh, next slide, please. There is an overwhelming amount of choices and options out there when it comes to partnering with vendors. At our most recent NCDA conference, there were over 100 vendors, but not all geared towards international students. So it will be important for university career offices to understand who these providers are. Next, my colleague Sonia will describe the types of providers and share some examples with you. Hi, this is Sonia Liang. Um, is everyone hearing me okay? Good. Um, in this session, I'm going to talk about different types of service providers, including some examples, and then I will talk about observations of the overall trends. So one way um, we look at categorizing providers is by their primary functions. According to NACE, 14% of exhibitors at the 2019 conference are recruiting platforms, which made it the largest type of exhibitors. So it's not surprising to say among all the career providers for international students, many of them offer an online job board. Recruiting services, similar to the functions of staffing agencies, often include representing employers by, um, to, to post positions, collect resumes, pre-screen candidates, and organize on-campus recruiting. 
is especially appealing to employers outside of the U.S. who may not have the time and resources um, to travel and in need of logistical support. Career coaching, advising, counseling is a popular category. Um, like Juan mentioned um, how she founded a company, providers will work with students one-to-one -one or in groups to equip them with job search skills, resume and cover letter writing strategies, networking and interviewing techniques. Networking is a service to provide access to students to connect with professionals in a certain industry through online one-to-one -one mentoring or online networking events. Some providers host alumni events for institutions that don't have offices in students' home countries. So most providers typically offer more than one service. In addition to what was mentioned above, other examples are educational articles and videos, um, database of sponsoring employers, information and news about visa regulations. So platform, um, in terms of platform, um, we also look at you know, platforms that are web-based, app-based, or in-person. Publications include books, magazines, or online articles. Some use mixed platforms. Um, when we select the providers, it's important to pay attention to the target audience of the service. Providers may have an intended audience, but the content may tell you otherwise. Depending on the founders and the team's expertise, experience, and resources, it may often lean one way or the other. So the target example, um, the, the example for target audience could be international students seeking jobs or internships in the U.S. or in their home countries. Sometimes the provider may mix the U.S. students seeking jobs abroad into international career service. However, it's important to know that for some countries, recruiting norms for local are drastically different than those for foreigners. There are also resources that focus on career professionals, such as NCA with an international students committee that focus on helping the helpers. Um, and there are also like career, um, career fairs, which we um, also listed under the service and function. So fee structure. Service providers could be for-profit, nonprofit, or government agencies. One important question before we make a decision on a vendor is not just to ask like, how much do they charge, but how do they make money? Knowing the source of revenue help us to determine whether there might be underlying conflicts of interest, conflicts of institution's value, or potential pitfall. Um, a for-profit provider may offer subscriptions through universities or individuals, it could be a one-time flat fee or charged by numbers of users. Nonprofit providers may get sponsorship from employers, charitable entities, governments, or other for-profit companies with re related products. Oftentimes, providers are willing to offer free workshops, books, or videos in order to solicit products to target clients. As career professional, we may want to ask more questions to identify any hidden fees or any additional features. So now let's move on to the overall trends. So some providers develop language or region specific services to cater to the top or region countries for international students. If you see the graphic on the top left side, um, that's the 2020, um, 2018 Open Doors Report lists the top or region countries as China, India, South Korea, Saudi Arabia, and Canada. The number of the students and the differences between home culture and host culture often has a positive correlation with market demand for career providers. Some providers focus solely on one country and provide language and culture specific support. Some providers target specific industries such as banking, consulting, finance, and IT due to the competitive nature of these industries and the high number of international students studying in these areas. And um, as you can see, career services for international students is an emerging field and a sub-industry. Many providers are startups founded by international alumni or people with international background. These providers tend to be fast growing and changing frequently. So one tip is to examine the business model and services by these providers periodically to make sure they remain consistent with the goal of the office. Some providers are interested in formalized collaboration with university career services, 
but some connect directly with student organizations or individuals. And we should be aware of providers reaching out to student groups directly. While many have legitimate services to provide, some may exploit students' urgency to get a job and impose a financial burden. Um, I've seen examples of providers offer um, like a pay internship um, and for a lot of money, and it may or may not really help the students eventually. So we want to be aware of that. Um, and then my colleague would talk a little bit more about um, the um, ethical decision making in the later section. So uh, here I want to give you some examples. Um, as my colleague mentioned earlier, we don't want to endorse any particular partner here. It's simply to give you um, an idea of the variety. So Going GoBlo um, is a subscription-based comprehensive online platform designed for international students exploring careers in the U.S. and U.S. students seeking opportunities abroad. Its unique feature include country and U.S. city guide for job and internship seekers um, targeting specific locations. Some students and career professionals find the resources may not be the best fit for home country job seekers. Global Me School is a provider in career coaching services. Like many similar providers, the team offer online video, in-person one-to-one coaching and workshops in collaboration with university career centers. These type of providers often meet the high demand of international students for customized career guidance, but it largely relies on the credibility, experience, and charisma of the speakers or coaches, which tends to be an ad hoc event rather than a constant go-to service for a career office. Lock in China um, is also a comprehensive platform, but as you can see from its name, it has a country-specific target audience, and it seeks collaboration with universities. For many career offices, they provide a specific expertise and connections with Chinese employers, which is not easily replaced with in-house resources. Um, as my colleague mentioned before, um, we also you know, see that um, there is an, a need to um, partner with more employers. So this is one of the examples. Um, I came across a couple app-based platforms that target international students, but there are not a lot. Initial View is one of them. The other one is Interstrike. They both provide an accessible platform for student users. Um, it, in, in the view, uh, initial View, for example, allows students to apply free jobs at a time and make sure recruiters respond within limited time frame before they can move on to the next candidate. So as a creative solution, uh, but some colleagues that I talked to seem to think that app-based platforms um, fade out over time and have it's hard to maintain active users. Contact Taiwan, another platform with target destination. Compared to Lock in China, uh, which connects Chinese students to home country employers, Contact Taiwan is a government initiative to serve industries and employers in Taiwan, including overseas branch companies. MyVisaJobs.com, um, my colleague Quan also mentioned before, is a different type of providers that primarily focus on visa-related information, an employer database for H-1B and green card sponsorship. It can completely solve the problem of visa barrier, but is a good research tool to get students started in collecting employer information and identifying friendly employers. Career Forum, CFN. Um, also another country region specific platform and is said to be the oldest and largest career fair providers for Japanese bilingual talents based on the recent experience um, to the Boston Career Forum and some students' testimonials. Um, it seems to reflect the rigid and procedural hiring practices in Japan, which makes it an effective um, tool for Japanese companies looking for Japanese speaking students, especially native speakers. So here's a quick overview. I hope that could give you a sense of the types of providers out there. And now it's time for my colleague Elise to talk about the ethical and culturally competent decision making. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Elise Bolin, and uh, in the next section, uh, we will be talking a little bit about the ethical and culturally competent decision making. 
Uh, the following content may seem as if it's based on ethical codes and professional standards uh, related to um, mostly professional counselors. While career counseling is primarily counseling that needs to be performed by professional counselors who need to follow these codes and standards, our discussion actually applies to all career development professionals, such as counselors, advisors, coaches, uh, indeed, our committee uh, is composed of all these career development professionals since 2012. As career development professionals working primarily in higher education career services, we are all obligated to know both legal and ethical issues, standards, guidelines, and so forth that applies to our professional identities, as well as work setting job titles, roles, and responsibilities. Uh, due to my own professional identity as a counselor and counselor educator, uh, I will be using the term student client to refer to international students that we work with. Uh, let's first talk about why these decisions matter. Uh, international students are a uniquely under-recognized, underserved, and marginalized minority group in the United States higher education system. Um, there are several important reasons for this, including their uncertain temporary legal status in the United States having limited uh, contingent work permission, not having immediate access to their primary social support system, such as family members. Uh, also, uh, although limited, some literature on international students show us that they tend to underutilize professional counseling and other professional support services, uh, maybe due to not being familiar with such services or having different cultural values or experiences around health seeking, or simply not knowing enough about the nature of such services and not having clear expectations from them. Furthermore, unfortunately, we don't seem to have enough specialized services or experts to work with international students in higher education uh, services. As we highlighted before, it seems to be a gap. Uh, thus, as career development professionals, we need to have self-awareness about our own cultural background and social group identities, which come with prejudices and biases about certain topics, including the career development needs of international students, what type of career services they need, our own view of work authorization, immigration options, policies, and so forth. This means that we need to ask ourselves first how we perceive each cultural group or also a unique individual and how this might impact um, our conceptualization of our students' client needs and counseling goals. This also means that we need to think deeper about the potential impact of our decisions on individuals, especially in the current climate, where there is increasing uncertainty, tension, as well as complications due to the frequently changing regulations. So given all these reasons, besides the ones such as the career services systems and gaps that we talked about before, in this section, we want to shift your focus to two major topics. One will be the ethical codes and professional competence standards, and the other will be the multicultural social justice and advocacy issues that may impact our work with, uh, with, uh, within the direct um, work with individuals and groups of students. So we also want to acknowledge here that there are challenges, of course, um, to the um, ethical and culturally competent decision making. So as you see in this list here, um, some of these challenges will be very familiar to you, such as multiple work roles and demands on us, uh, maybe insurance reimbursement limitations, so we can't refer students to every single um, third party provider. This is especially an issue with the mental health uh, resources, um, institutional policies, expectations, your dynamics, the power dynamics at your career services, what your supervisors, managers, wants you to prioritize in your use of time. But regardless of these challenges, again, we are all obligated to be familiar and follow the ethical codes and the professional competency standards. So given the limitations of our time here, uh, I will highlight only two or three uh, from this list. Um, again, all of them are very, very important, but let's look into the lack of enough resources. So we all come from different types of institutions where the availability and allocation of resources will be different as well. We may not always have as much time or support or money to explore, choose, and use the most effective or useful resources, including the third party providers. Whether they are consultants that support international students, whether they are career assessment programs um, or softwares, or maybe other professional helpers, fee-based networking or job application platforms. 
However, we're still, again, obligated to act in the best interest of our student clients so they are not harmed. They are supported, they are offered confidentiality and privacy in the whole process of referrals and connecting them to third party providers. We also need to make sure we use an informed consent protocol, which means, which means that we make them aware of all process, all the options, risks, and so forth. Thus, they can make informed decisions about using our services or using the options or resources that we provide for them. So another important point here that I want to uh, detail, another challenge is the significance of career interventions to help individuals' well-being. So again, some career services centers' policies will be different. They may miss this point, but the literature is showing us there is increasingly a critical link between career development, academic work experiences, and personal well-being, psychological well-being. Thus, um, we need to be really, really aware of the importance of providing international students the needs that they have in order of priority. They come to see us to use our services, so we need to clarify for them what they can expect from our services. We need to take the time to build the report. We need to identify their needs clearly in priority order. We need to explore cultural and environmental circumstances before, before we even think about referring them to any third party provider or recommending them to use specific information resources and technology. This is also relevant to another item here, misperception that anyone who wants to help can become a career development professional. So even if maybe some of these third party providers introduce themselves as career development professionals, coaches, advisors, we are obligated to, to, to do our research before doing any referral, any collaboration to make sure they have the professional competence to work with our international student, which is a very important ethical issue. So in this image here on this slide, you see how all of these discussions are coming together uh, in this graph here. So there are so many other professional competency standards that may or may not be relevant to you, to your work title, to your work setting. But here, assuming that you are career professionals in higher education settings, we want to encourage you to revisit and increase your familiarity with first NCDA Code of Ethics. Of course, with NCDA minimum competencies for multicultural career counseling and development, um, as well as NACE professional competencies, which will be relevant to most of us in higher education. And then, as you are doing all of that, we also want to encourage you to please check the multicultural and social justice competencies, counseling competencies, and ACA advocacy competencies, especially in the case of some dilemmas that you may um, encounter. Very quickly, for example, some career development professionals may think, I don't have the competency, the language skills to work with an international student. No. We are all obligated to work with individuals from diverse backgrounds, okay? So also in case of having students who cannot afford the cost of third party providers, again, we need to use our advocacy skills or action strategies, maybe to come up with some other institutions nearby to share the cost, or maybe to bring those career development professionals to our services by covering those fees as institutions, not asking international students to pay additional fees for these services while they are already paying extra student fees in most institutions for their student services. So these are some important advocacy action skills that we need to be aware of. If you encounter different dilemmas, different challenges that we covered, we also want to encourage you after you look into these competencies, these frameworks, we also want to encourage you to refer to ethical decision-making framework, which will be the next two slides. So in the next two slides, you will be seeing this ethical decision-making framework. There are many different models. Uh, we got this one from a specific resource that you will be seeing in the references. So this will follow, again, a certain model, which will begin with the recognition of the ethical issue and then collecting all the facts. And my colleagues before highlighted some really important points for us to explore the facts about each issue, each student need, but then also each uh, optional resource and third party, third party provider. Next. You will need to, after collecting the facts, you will need to evaluate our alternative actions, our alternative resources, third party providers very carefully. Um, and you will make a decision, informed decision, an ethical decision, a culturally competent decision before, again, we make the referral for our students and we will accompany them 
in the process of them using these resources. So we can test that with them. We can evaluate the usefulness um, of these services for our students. And now we can act and reflect again on the outcomes of using these resources as a, as a center or as a, as a career development professional um, ourselves. So we want to encourage you to, um, to revisit these slides, but also the detailed resources by following the links. Uh, we truly believe that uh, these will be very important for you, again, regardless of your professional identity and background, before you make a decision of using specific resources. And then my colleague, uh, Nicole Anderson, will follow um, this section uh, with some more information, more guidelines for you to pick the, the right um, resources. Thank you, Elif. There were many factors to consider when outsourcing expertise to a vendor. I think there were two important parts to this process. The first is looking at your offices and your university's readiness and capabilities. And the second is assessing vendors and their services and tools. Of course, you'll want to vet the vendor and demo more than one service or tool or consultant to ensure that they meet the standards of your office, the university, and the professional community. While you may be hoping to offload labor and or expertise through contracting with the vendor, there is still significant diligence that needs to be accomplished by the Career Services Office. And you'll want to integrate the service into the fabric of the university by optimizing promotion across campus, technology transition, and sharing of resources, among other things. In addition to assessing the product, you should anticipate other responsibilities approval, purchasing, implementation, managing, including troubleshooting, monitoring and evaluation. So we've put together a guide for this webinar, a handout that includes two sections. The first is best practices for incorporating e-learning tools and technologies in career services and factors to consider when outsourcing to a third party vendor. And the second part of the guide is a rubric for assessing career services vendors. So that's what I'll be using as my guide throughout the next few slides, and it will be available to you after the webinar. So let's take a closer look at factors to consider and questions you should be asking as you engage in this process. The big picture. Many of the factors and questions that I bring up will be highly depend will highly depend on the setting in which you work. Uh, so keep that in mind: the type and size of the university, your budget, norms about processes. Some people will have more hoops to jump through, while others may not even know those hoops exist until they embark on a project like this one. So, do you have a timeline for the project? Will there be different phases involved with different stakeholders and or campus partners? And who are the stakeholders? What are their roles? Does it make sense to designate a team? And who needs to approve the product and the vendor? In fact, who can sign a contract if one is necessary? Campus partners. What partners on and off campus may benefit from sharing the service or tool and new relationship with this vendor? Could the tool even serve as a bridge builder with a department whose goals align with yours? Keep in mind, though, that sharing a resource might include extending to a larger population and will likely increase cost and maintenance. Partners might include the International Student Services Office, other career centers on campus, um, alumni relations, or even the library. That's certainly a good partner for any e-learning resource or technology. Partnering with the library may help with promoting the tool, and it could be part of a larger group of tools for which students have a single sign-on. Let's talk about funding. Who will pay for the service? If the cost is subscription-based, have you planned ahead in your projections for the current and next fiscal years? Could you even share the cost with campus partners who can also benefit from the service? Um, and what are, what are other options for funding? At Tufts, we applied for a university diversity grant to support the cost of a keynote speaker at our International Student Career Conference. We were asked to provide more information on the grant application than we would have needed if we simply paid for the speaker through our own budget. Um, would we continue to apply for the same grant to bring keynotes on campus, or would we look elsewhere? Um, was, were some of the questions that were asked um, and got us to thinking. And how were we planning to assess the outcomes of the keynote session in order to share in our report back to the grant committee? So some of these things we had thought about and others we needed to think through more strategically. 
Other ideas might even include working with your advancement office, doing some crowdfunding, finding an alumni or employer sponsor. Um, I've even seen in the Boston area, local colleges and universities collaborating. Um, we've had some univer universities partner in putting together large scale events for international students that draw employers. So the benefit for the employer is one stop shopping, while the benefit to the university is cost sharing on things like live streaming to students who can't attend in person and sharing the cost of bringing speakers like an immigration lawyer. Other things to consider, staffing. Um, that's a key um, bucket amongst all of these buckets. Who's the liaison or point of contact to the vendor? Who will be responsible for maintaining the service or tool? How will they be trained? Um, if you're partnering with other campus departments, who's the point of contact there? In fact, who can students, staff, faculty, employers contact with questions? Um, and who can answer technical questions and troubleshoot with users? So this is a good segue to talking about technology services. Um, can you test drive the service and tool? Um, will the vendor provide a demonstration, uh, particularly of the back end, if it is a technology? Um, will it be the same as the product you know, that was demonstrated to you by the vendor? Um, I've seen that happen, the vendor not being able to deliver the product that they demoed. Um, and that would be a good reason to break a contract or terminate a relationship. Um, will the vendor provide references or list of current customers? This is an important question to consider. Does the service or tool integrate with other technologies used in the Career Center and on campus? And who can help you determine this? Is your IT department aware of uh, the fact that you're going to acquire this um, platform or this new tool? Highly important is what kind of security, data security does the technology use or, or web security? Um, and does the vendor provide assistance or help desk for technology um, and customer service issues? If we think about the purchasing process or the procurement process, some universities need to approve any vendor that is providing technology or um, a, a, any service that comes with a contract. This could actually help you hand off the process of assessing specifications that are outside your area of expertise, including terms of service, legal considerations, and technical standards like accessibility and data privacy. And many universities have policies about who can sign contracts. So before you sign on the dotted line, check with purchasing technology services or, or legal department. Um, data security is a critical factor in the acquisition of any technology and universities are bound by FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. So, you know, if you can check in with legal or check in, you know, have your purchasing department check with legal. Um, so, and know what your responsibility is when users decide to access and pay for services with the vendor beyond the service you have contracted with the vendor. Other things to consider are promotion, um, monitoring and, eva and evaluation, I think are often pieces of the process that get the least attention. They may get cut if you're lacking in staffing, but this is critical to include so you can assess your return return on investment, you know, and how will you use data to tell your story um, after spending so much time assessing products and going through the process of acquiring this new technology or, um, or relationship with, with a consultant. We've provided a great rubric, which you'll get to see a glimpse of on the next slide, and it's adapted from the Center for Teaching and Learning at Western University in Ontario, Canada. The authors are Lauren Anstey, Anstey and Gavin P.L. Watson. And um, this list right here is from that rubric and includes some of the criteria you'll assess when looking at vendors and their products. And I want to comment about a few of them. Um, educational content. One of the questions I always ask is, what sources do you use for your content? How often is it updated? I think this is really important given the changing nature of laws around OPT in the US and generally the changing nature of work permission and the job market in other countries. Part of our role in working with international students is not just helping them with the job search in the US, but helping them with a the job search in their home country and in other countries. And, you know, so it's critical that resources like country guides are current. Another way to think about this is that the resources are also serving as professional development tools for enhancing our own expertise. So we need to, for them to be on point. Um, 
Accessibility, I think, is highly important at Tufts. We recently signed a contract for a new mentoring platform, but it was held up in procurement be, for a while because Tufts has very high standards around web accessibility, and the vendor and product needed to build in some more capabilities before we were able to really hit go. So in keeping with time, let me go on to the next slide and just show you a glimpse of the guide that we are providing to you um, you know, after, this, after the webinar, we will email it to you, and it's also a link in the webinar. So now I will turn it back to Kendra for our summary. Thank you, Nicole. Um, so I'm going to just summarize quickly so that we do have time for a couple questions. Um, so as we shared a lot of information today, just some main takeaways. Third-party vendors or providers are just one of the many ways to address the needs of international students. Um, we want to serve all students if you're working in that campus setting and we recognize the challenges that international students face may require more than what we have to offer. Um, so just considering if some of these service providers could be a good support to what your campus is currently doing. Um, next, you want to assess your organization's capabilities first because engagement with an outside vendor requires time and oversight. So as Nicole was sharing some of those different factors to consider, you especially want to pay attention to is it even feasible for us to bring in someone else to this process right now. Um, next, you want to recognize that there's a lot of variety amongst the services and providers out there. Um, and even services that may seem very similar or platforms that may seem to offer the same information could provide a very different experience for the student as well as for employers or the career service office. Um, so take the time to really examine and get to know some of the services that are out there. Um, and then finally, you know, as Eva shared, it's important to consult the ethical codes, professional standards, and guidelines of your own organization to ensure that you're making the best choices and those practices are well informed. Um, so the next two slides will include all the references to the resources that we've mentioned throughout and that again will be emailed to everyone. Um, so now I think we'll take some time to answer any questions. Um, again, you can learn more about our committee on the NCBA website. Find us on LinkedIn to continue the discussion if you have more questions for us or more things you're interested in learning about international students and career development. Um, and we thank you all for participating today. So I think there was one question um, already that says, what has been the employer buy-in on those joint campus events? Nicole, maybe you can answer that one. So the joint campus events, I think you might be referring to, um, in Boston there were several schools who um, put together a conference and um, the employer buy-in was really that it was, you know, again, I, I said one-stop shopping, they only needed to um, show up on one campus to meet with students from um, a range of great schools and um, and we I, th this was an event actually that Tufts did not participate in um, it was some other schools but from my understanding the employers were um, both in a space to pro as panelists to provide expertise around hiring international students, why it's easy to hire an international student, um, their experiences, uh, employing international students um, on OPT, um, through C CPT for internships. But there was also, um, I believe, an open component, career fair component, so to speak, so that um, employers could meet directly with interested students. Um, so I think that there were different opportunities for the employers to participate throughout the day and to demonstrate their expertise, to meet face-to-face -face with students, but also to learn more about this landscape and to learn more about um, from others, from other employers, from university career uh, practitioners and, and uh, staff from the International Student Center. I hope that answers your question.
Uh, I have one more question that just came in um, that says, have any of you hosted any workshops for employers to educate them on hiring international students? If so, what did that look like? Um, I can take this question. I'm Sonia from Brandeis University. Um, uh, it's it's a really great question because it has been um, um, uh, something that uh, a lot of career professionals have been trying to, um, to to deal with is how to educate employers. I think third party could comes in in a way um, that could provide it expertise in terms of like regions or if they have like specific employer connections. Um, the event that we hosted before we organize an international student career fair. And as part of the component, we have um, um, a VIP lunch, which all the employers attending are included on that list. So they attended a, a lunch session while our international students and scholars office would send someone to talk about um, OPT and CPT process. Um, so it's a way to help employers to learn a little bit of information. Um, some people like really excited to learn more about this. Um, some people may just be sitting in the audience, but then they realize like, oh, even I hire a lot of international students, I might not know this one particular thing. Um, so it was like, incredibly helpful to have this kind of education uh, sessions. And we try using emails, um, websites, information, and targeted posters before, but employer didn't seem to have time to read those. Um, so it's more important to have either like a direct um, like way to answer their questions, like someone who is a point person to answer some of their specific questions, um, or have some kind of like component that could be attached to your existing programs with employers. Anyone else that has other experience to share? Uh, not to share about that question, but we did get another question that says, has anyone had poor experiences with the vendor or third party? What was the fallout and how did you manage the issues that follow? Um, I can briefly share. It actually wasn't with a vendor that GW had directly partnered with, um, but there was an organization that held a career fair um, and they particularly targeted um, international students and more specifically Chinese students. Um, so it was a weekend event and then Monday morning, a lot of the career staff were getting emails from students who were very upset because they basically said that it was um, not so much a career fair, but kind of just a, a pitching event for Chinese students. And some of the things they were asking seemed kind of suspicious, such as students submitting a deposit or promises that they were going to get um, an internship with, you know, top companies, but overall it just seemed kind of suspect. So from the career office's perspective, you know, I was calling other counselors to try to find out, like, how did this organization even kind of get filtered into, um, you know, our events list. We use Handshake, which can also include events not held on campus. Um, so I think that was an important lesson that some of these services may be targeting students directly. And although the student may be communicating with them, they may still look to the university to kind of help mediate what may be going on. So although we didn't partner directly with them, um, we went back to kind of, again, making sure we're looking at how do we help students assess any of these offers they might be getting. Um, so we've now included information on our website on how to, you know, look at job postings or events and just kind of ask some questions before students get caught up in a situation that may not be a good fit for them. I have a question on this end. Um, somebody asked, it just like flashes and I don't know how to find out where the questions went. Um, but the question is about um, based on the top region of um, home countries, uh, um, uh, China, India, and so forth. And are there, were there any liberal arts students were higher? Um, I guess that's the question. Um, so for the presentation, I was listing these top um, countries of a region is to show a point where 
why there are so many uh, resources and uh, third-party providers out there targeting specific countries. Um, there often each um, I've often asked like why you know we don't have resources for European students for you know like students or um, um, Latin American countries like I get asked about like inclusive inclusivity in terms of like service resources. Um, the reason why uh, what we observe in the market is because there are um, larger numbers of international students coming from these countries, and they also have a really high demand for the most competitive industries, such as consulting, banking. Um, IT is a is an interesting industry that it does have a lot of employers already familiar with hiring international students, um, but it's still a huge market. So it doesn't mean that students from a liberal art background or other majors wouldn't be hired by employers. It's just in terms of resources, it might be more limited. Um, so looking into maybe resources focused on certain industry in general, rather than just international student would be helpful for those pockets of students. I hope that answered a question. And in relation to that question, this is Elif Bolan. Maybe one more thing besides what Sonia said we should highlight. Um, it's, it's also a, a, a multicultural social justice advocacy issue uh, sometimes to work with students um, such as liberal arts students uh, who may feel a little bit excluded or underserved um, when most of the career fair employers or networking events or the third party providers um, you know, seem to be working for students um, for um, for these um, you know um, hiring industries or more promising industries, so um, that's why we also wanted to highlight the advocacy. Um, so as we are working um, with these students, we need to make sure we are inclusive, and um, we need to make sure that um, again from an ethical standpoint, we have the professional competence. For example, NCDA minimum competencies tell us that we need to be competent with information resources and technology. So we regularly evaluate them, um, so they serve the needs of all students, regardless regardless of their academic background or the specific job industries that they want to go. So it is something important for us to discuss with our peers, colleagues, supervisors, but also our institutions so that our resources are allocated for the needs of all students, not just certain students. And uh, for myself, as uh, someone who coach students, this is Quan Siegel. Um, so I coach students across uh, the countries, and uh, I also received lots of questions from liberal arts students uh, about how can I find jobs when I have a liberal arts degree, and that's always a challenge, yeah. right? So from from my experience, if the schools be able to engage the students, especially with the networking skills, that is going to help them a lot because those jobs that they target could be jobs that look for soft skills. They could be, uh, they can become more outstanding among other candidates if the employers have experience working with you or uh, working with them or collab collaborating with them before making a decision to hire them. So I would say, all degrees, they still have possibilities to get hired, but for the uh, degree that have become more challenging, like liberal arts, they need to go out and network more. Are there any more questions? I don't see any new ones in the chat or in the Q&A? I'm not seeing any on my end either. So I, I think we will go ahead and wrap that up. Um, to all of our presenters, thank you guys again for your time and effort today. Um, attendees, I will be sending out um, in the next couple of days, you will receive a link to the webinar as well as their um, PowerPoint presentation. So thank you to everyone for joining us today, and thank you to our presenters. Thank you, everyone. For thank joining you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.